My name is Gabriel Kelly, I'm the director of the Adelaide Thinkers in Residence and I'd firstly like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Ghana land and acknowledge elders, Aboriginal elders past and present and also to acknowledge the particular rela spiritual relationship the Ghana people have with the land. Distinguished South Australians all, it's a thrill to see you here. This is the opening lecture of the 21st Thinker in Residence, John McTurnan, in a residency entitled At Your Service, the Design and Delivery of 21st Century Public Services. And I'd now like to invite Premier Mike Grant to come and properly introduce John McTurnan in this residency. Thank you, Premier. Thanks very much, Gabe, and to John McTurnan, to our ministers and CEOs and distinguished visitors, every one of you. I was delighted that John McTurnan uh, has accepted our invitation to become our 21st thinker. And I'm particularly so because it's about the public sector, the public service. In fact, I thought that the title was going to be Are You Being Served? But apparently the more sensible uh, heads prevailed while I was in New Zealand last week. But the fact of the matter is, is that we have an outstanding public service that has been a great social innovator. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be constantly working to do better. It's really about the changing nature of the public service and how we can be more effective that we've asked John McTurnan uh, to, to, to come here. John is renowned as one of the world's foremost public policy experts. He has lent expertise to governments of varied persuasions the world over in the UK, the US, in Europe, South America, the Middle East, as well as here in Australia. His initial projects will focus on the vital areas of health and education, and I think maybe a bit of housing as well, to help us develop and deliver even better services, to help us better engage with the people who provide these crucial services, as well as the people they have provided to and for, to highlight the cultural and administrative changes we need to, to make, to reshape and refocus our services to make them more effective, to help design a toolkit that can be employed across all areas of government when we're devising and delivering services. It's about making sure government is better able to provide tailored, high quality support and that it works closely with, as well as diligently for, individuals, families, neighbourhoods and communities. And these are areas that John is eminently qualified to help us meet in terms of the challenges presented to us. He's the director of the recently established non-partisan New Scotland Foundation and has been described as one of Scotland's leading political thinkers. He was the chair of education in the London borough of Southwark, and played a pivotal role in the establishment of the Tate Modern Gallery in the former Bankside Power Station which is now the world's most visited modern art gallery. As director of the London Docklands Development Corporation, he oversaw major infrastructure developments in what was Europe's largest urban regeneration project. And these developments included the Canary Wharf development and the Docklands Light Railway. He has extensive experience in commercial television, has written for some of the world's best known media publications, including the Daily Telegraph, The Guardian, and the Times. So the title of John's lecture this evening is At Your Service, Design and Delivery of 21st Century Public Services. I have no doubt that you will find his presentation as engaging as it is insightful. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce and welcome our 21st Adelaide Thinker in Residence, John McTurnan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for that very very kind introduction. It's a real privilege to be invited to be part of the Thinkers in Residence program. Um, you're quite modest about it. This is the only government in the world uh, that's had the humility to say, my government, our government, doesn't have a monopoly on all the best ideas. Many other political leaders are interested in doing this. They've looked at it, they've thought about it, and all of them, each and every one, have decided it would be a sign of weakness to say that. And I have to say it's a sign of strength to say that you can listen to ideas uh, from outside, from other people. Uh, and I think it's actually what makes uh, South Australia the strong state it is now. Uh, it's, a, it's a state which is willing to 
embrace new ideas, new ways of thinking. Uh, and I think that is the way that you, that you survive and you thrive uh, in a global economy. So like, since I've been here, there's one fact that I need to tell everybody because it always surprises people. And some of you have heard this already, but I want to say it. Um, everybody says to me, this is a small town. And look, in one sense, that's true because I do keep meeting the same people. But it <laughs> <laughs> that may be because I just go to the Tuxedo Cat for a drink every evening, um, which is a very good place to go to, Tuxedo Cat, King William Street. Um, it, but you're not a small town. If Adelaide was in the UK, it'd be the third largest city. It's as big as Glasgow and Edinburgh put together. Sometimes I think it's because you keep comparing yourself to other cities on this continent, in this country. Uh, that would be fine if the only other cities with which you were competing were in this country. But of course they're not. You're competing with cities globally. And maybe it's best to compare yourself with best in class. So the Edinburgh comparison is a good one because the fringe is a, is a great, it's a great relationship, it's a relationship of strength. It's one that the flows are going backwards and forwards. So I think, I spoke about this a bit at a, at a seminar um, about, <coughs> about vibrant Adelaide, about making Adelaide more vibrant. And somebody summed it up on Twitter by saying, you know, every time you make a comparison between Adelaide and an eastern city, a dolphin dies in the Port River. <laughs> so look, just be very, very careful what you're doing. Now, I have got a question to start with, which is, does anybody here, somebody's got to, does anybody here know the date uh, that Australia exchanged the pound for the dollar? In come the dollars, in come the cents, to replace the pounds and the shillings and the pence. Be prepared, folks, when the coins begin to mix on the 14th of February, 1966. There's a point to that, and I'll come back to it, but that is, why is that, that, that actually is a segment of a commercial that was four minutes and 20 seconds long. <laughs> you can, it's on the Film Australia website, but it's amazing to think that you could devote four, I mean, four minutes, 20 seconds is a program on YouTube nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> but then it was an, an infomercial. Um, the reason you remember it, because it's cheesy. Dollar bill is a, is a dollar bill. Um, there's music, there's a rhythm, and it's actually designed to make you understand something quite important, quite complex, in the easiest form possible. And it is, once you hear that, it is impossible to unremember the 14th of um, So we're going to come back to that later. So look, what, this question of being at your server, what's the problem with modern public services? It's a cliche to say the world is changing and it's rapidly changing. But cliches are cliches because they're true. People repeat them because they're true. What's the most significant fact about South Australia at the moment? You're an aging society. You're not alone in it. You may be the oldest at the moment in terms of interstate comparisons. Even China's aging. You know, the world population peaks about 2050, 2060 at 9 billion. And then it starts to fall as birth rate falls. We're living in a globe which is aging. That's a huge change that's going on. And it's got, it'll be one of the def defining characteristics of this century is uh, coming to terms with an aging society. Now, I'm very loath to talk. And I quite often slap people down and say there's a burden coming because the burden of aging. It's not a burden. To add 30 years to the average lifespan in the last century is a huge achievement. And it's a huge achievement about you know, it's our sense, our values. We've delivered a society where people aren't allowed, uh, by and large, to die, die too young. Um, the world's changing. It's aging. In technology, things are changing. Think about telephones. Back in the 70s, only one in three households had their own dedicated phone line. And it could take you up to a year to get a phone line actually attached to your house. It's almost impossible to believe that in a situation where a family of four will now have maybe six Six mobile phones, four personal ones, and the parents maybe have one for work as well as one for, uh, for the social life. That's a huge change, and that, that change is accelerating as, as computer companies come to realize that a phone, <coughs> a mobile phone is not a mobile phone. A mobile phone is a computer on which you can make phone calls. Uh, and that's the big shift that's going on with, I, with, with smartphones, with Android, with, with iPhones, with Blackberries. And we really haven't yet started to see how public services interact with that. We're barely seeing how private services 
are interacting with that. But that's going to be a huge driver. And what else? There's a massive economic shift. But what's the cost of... I mean, increasing productivity is really important for the state, for this country, um, for all industrialised countries. But what it means is that in a smaller and smaller proportion of the population actually work in blue-collar work. Sometime in the mid-90s in Australia and, and in the UK, uh, white-collar, monthly-paid professionals became the largest single class. They're bigger than the working class. Um, the salariat, the, sa the people who paid a salary monthly, are the most important uh, political class. It's, it's, that will carry on growing. If There's a figure that Gordon Brown used to quote in, in the UK, which was, on, of the 400,000 jobs that were created in London in between 1997 and 2007, only 40,000 went to Londoners because they didn't have the skills and qualifications. People came from outside. People came from South Australia. People came from, from France. People came from all around the world to work in London in those jobs. And so there's a huge, huge shift going on where if you don't have skills, you can't be a lift attendant anymore. You can't be a park keeper. You can't be a bus conductor. The whole set of jobs that have been er eradicated. That's a huge shift. But probably the biggest shift in the economy is the is the increasing number of women in the workforce. That's a process that started 20, 30 years ago. There's a great economist, actually, a South Korean economist, who said that the most important invention of the 20th century for liberating women was the washing machine. Why was that? Because the washing machine did two things. One is for people who did their own washing, it actually took a day's, it gave, it took a day's work away from you. you the second one was it eliminates an entire class of workers servants who used to do washing uh, for households. And what happened to them? They were absorbed into the economy. There was the beginning of women's march into, in, into paid labour. And now if you've been talking to clinicians, and they all say that in our medical schools now, a majority of the people training in medical schools are women. So you see women moving through the professions. It's not stopped yet, but it's probably the biggest long-term change uh, in the economy that's happening. And then finally, we're just getting richer and richer. I mean, it doesn't make us happy. Uh, at times, Australia seems to me to be both the richest and the grumpiest country I've ever been in. <laughs> um, a real sense of kind of people living well, but also feeling a bit uneasy about it, or just being a bit grumpy. But living, sta living standards dub are doubling every 25, 30 years. At the same time, people are going to people, more and more people are going through higher education. So you go from a situation where in the 50s, what? One in 20 people maybe went to university to a situation where one in five, one in three. Now, what does that do? Prosperity plus education, it kills deference. It's the end of deferential approach to authority. It's much harder to be a, pr a premier or a minister or an MP or a chief executive or just a, a, an ordinary worker in a public service now. Partly because people think they know better because they've got a degree. Partly because sometimes they do know better because, because they were also able to access information about what's going on in similar services all around the world. And I know GPs sometimes say they've got these patients, they call them heart sink patients, you know, your heart sinks when they come in the door. They <laughs> come with this bundle of papers saying, what's wrong with them? Uh, they call them the worried well. Well, the thing is, that's actually a form of energy. These are people who want in some way to take more control over their own lives, over their own health. You can't push them away, you can't deny that information to people. People have that information. The, the, the real question for us is how do we turn that to our advantage? So people have really high expectations of public services. It's not simply because uh, they're public services. I think they've got high expectations of all services. Uh, the private sector, if you just look at, uh, I know the chairman of ASOS, as seen on screen, which is an online retail company which no men will know about, but lots of women uh, will, because it sells online fashion. It's they just this year started selling uh, postage-free delivery uh, to Australia. What are they doing? They're opening up some competition to the chains that Australia has got in some markets, far less competitive markets than other places. That's unsustainable. I was talking to somebody in Coffee Branch, a very, very fine coffee shop, um, and he was talking about the, co the comparative cost of electronic equipment imported from the US from a website or bought uh, bought here. These things are unsustainable. They're part, of a, they're part of an older economy. Just as in the 1980s, barriers were, were being taken down, these things are going have to have to be taken down. So th the high expectations are, are very real. And there's a, 
in public services, you get you know, David Cameron with Big Society, you get Obama uh, bringing in social impact bonds, which is a, a way to try to, to, pay, to pay public services for result, by results, to try and find ways of bringing extra money in. Because we all know in the public sector, all of us who work in it, all of us who know about it, observe it, we know there are some people who are very, very costly through their life. Um, but it's too expensive to sort them out at the beginning, so we pay these costs all the way through their lives. Uh, and there's an experiment in Peterborough to actually have, a, have a, a charity come in and do probation with the aim of being paid a higher price if they have a lower reoffending rate. Now, these kinds of things are where we're going to be developing to try to cut out, it's invest to save, to try to cut out some of these social costs. There's those innovations. And one of the dangers in the public sector is that sometimes the means become the ends. So we talk a lot about choice. I, I, we did it, the UK Labour government did this, a lot of choice in public services. There's a really good saying in British retail, which is customers don't want choice. They just want what they want. Now, that is actually what they want. They want to go in somewhere and get what they want then. They don't care how you deliver what they want, but they do want what they want. And I think sometimes uh, we mistake process for purpose uh, in the public service. And that's a really important thing to hold on to, that we do things for a purpose. If we consult for a purpose, the purpose of consultation is not to get everybody to agree. The purpose of consultation is not simply to sell a decision that's been made already. Consultation is about getting consent for a set of ideas that address a real problem and I have a proper conversation about, is there really a problem here? Is this the right way to do it? If, you know, if there's a problem, we do need to act, we'll act in this way. So I think we, there's, a, there's, a, there's an American retail chain where they've got two rules for customer service. And it's a, re, it's a, a useful one for politics, it's a useful one for government. Rule one, the customer is always right. And rule two, when the customer is wrong, refer to rule one. <laughs> and there's a point there, which is, you know, there's these, um, Umberto Eco once said about the difference between IBM PCs and Apple is that Apple is Catholic and IBM is Protestant. And what he meant was Apple, if you have an Apple computer, you do it the Apple way. You've got an iPod, you do it the Apple way. It is, it's like the old medieval papacy. You do it our way or there's no other way. Whereas the IBM, the, the, IBM, the PC, can be applied in lots of different contexts. Um, and it just made me, I was reading that again at the weekend, it made me wonder that, that the danger for government is that government is Catholic, but the people are Protestant. <laughs> the government says, this is our way, we're going to do it this way, and if you don't do it this way, you can't have a service. If you don't, if you don't present, um, I had an amazingly circular conversation, I've had a number of these, I mean, it's not, it's not fair to name the department, but you end up with circular conversations about saying, so why is this done by this department and not by that, or why is this funded by the Commonwealth and not by, and, and why is that not funded by the Commonwealth? Because that looks exactly like that. And it's kind of, well, it isn't because it isn't. Like, fair enough, you can say that to a Brit, because I don't have a vote here. Um, but, at, but at a certain point, uh, the public aren't, the voters aren't going to accept that you're just told the irrational and arbitrary lines are going through <coughs> services just because they've always existed. They can change and they, people know that things can change and they, and they really should change. Now, now, Mike was talking about um, the challenge that this is going to cause to, to public sector workers, and I'm a, I'm a great believer uh, in the strength, and the, in the strength of the innovation and the desire to serve of public service workers. Um, I think Tony Blair made a big mistake when he talked about scarred his back from reform because, look, go government ministers can't deliver services. They're done for them by their staff. They're delivered by staff. Staff have to be inspired, not shouted at. I worked in Scotland. I've, I've, I've followed a boss who had used to try to get his way by shouting at people. And I always said to my staff and other senior civil servants when I was in the civil service, I don't shout at adults. I do shout at my kids, and it doesn't work. So I've got no idea how it would work if you shout at adults. <laughs> and I think this, it's a really... It, we have to understand that all of the people who sometimes are producers of public services are themselves also consumers. Teachers are parents. So are doctors and nurses. So are cops. That we are, 
that one of the beauties of the internet and this, of this, the new world we live in is that we all have multiple identities that we can actually act out. I'm not just a public, uh, public, ref public service reform expert. I'm actually a former punk. Um, I used to the punk fanzine. Now, that's before the days of the internet, but you can find my first ever review uh, of a band called The Scars on the internet. You know, so my, I've got, it's one of many interests. All of us have got these five, six, seven different people that we are, and we are them with the people who, 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 with whom we share a common interest. And that's one of the great complexities that we have to learn to handle. The people no longer are defined by the postcode or by the job. You know, you live there, you must be this kind of person, or what is it you meant to say when you meet somebody at? I know what you say when you meet somebody who's come from Britain, you say, when did you get here? Um, and then have a conversation at the end of it, you say, when are you going? Uh, and, <laughs> and in London, when you meet people, you say, what do you do? Because it's basically a very hard-working city. And I know people here say, where did you go to school? I, I don't understand why. But I, um, so we've got to understand that our, our workers, Tom, look, Tom, Tom Peters, the management guru, says this. He says, every workplace is full of workers who are committed, passionate, innovative, driven, imaginative, selfless, except for the seven hours a day they come to work in your office. <laughs> and that's, we've really got to remember that when we're doing public service reform. So one thing is, we've got a problem, we've got these drivers, what do we do about it? The answer is let's recognize that a lot of what we want to see in the future is here already. William Gibson, the Canadian writer, he's got a saying which I love. He says, the future's here already. It's just unevenly distributed. And I think that's actually true about public services. What we want to see in health and schools is there in pockets, but we want to see it right, right through the system. And the, the frame for my, uh, for my residency is thinking about, it's, I guess, quite it's jargon, I'm sorry, but co-production. It's jargon, but it does actually... It does what it says, you know, co-production, we do things together. The simplest way of understanding that is, I don't know, I've got a teenage son. Um, getting him up in the morning and getting him to high school involves a lot more work than I think the school ever appreciate. You know, that, that his education couldn't happen if I didn't get him out of bed. Um, and he doesn't always want to get... The same is true of a five-year-old or a six-year-old. Um, that's a simple thing. On a, on a, on a, on a kind of... On a, on a different note, from the minute you start reading to your children to the time when you make sure they get their homework in on time in high school, the parents, actually quite often grandparents and aunts and uncles and the extended family, are deeply involved in producing education. That's really, really important because that means there's a, there's a, there's a source of energy out there that could be tapped into. Now, the best schools do that. The best principals do that. But it's not done uniformly, uh, and it's not done, it's not done consistently, and it's not done always, I suspect, in the best way to support the parents to do that. Another example of cooperative, like an obvious place, is health. Most people, to some extent or another, are responsible for managing their own health. You make your own decision about whether to go to a GP or not. I mean, you actually make a self-diagnosis. It's at a very simple level, but that is actually you looking after yourself. A lot of health uh, conditions are, are chronic. I've got arthritis. Um, by and large, I look after that myself. I go to the doctor. Uh, if it gets worse, I get... That is co-managed by me uh, and, and the health service. And that's true of a lot of health. A lot of health has got co-production. And probably the best example of, of it is that it's not the cops that keep the streets safe. It's us. It's ordinary, ordinary citizens walking up and down the streets keep streets safe. Very rarely do you need the cops to keep, the, keep, keep law and order. And I think it's, it's just worth realizing that public services are not simply delivered by staff or delivered by government. They're actually delivered by all of us. Now, that's an insight into how the world actually operates. And that's what needs to be built on in terms of, of public service reform. So look, the, the difficulty with government services uh, is that we know from our own lives that activity is more important than passivity. If you actively manage your health or actively manage your own education, actively manage your own career, you do better than if you're simply passive. But I think there's a real difficulty with public policy because policy is quite often done to 
done on behalf of, done for. It's rarely done with. And I think that whole frame of how we think about fundamental uh, public policy, it, it, we need to break it. We need to really take it apart and rebuild it. I'm just going to show a, a brief video about education. Uh, education. So could we have the lights down? <laughs> 